Is it allergies? allergies? Can you hear yourself in your room? No, but Keeping it sounds quiet? like a, it sounds like a bee. Like a Ooh, I don't like that. Oh no. <laughs> Let's see, where are we at? Where are we at? We are on chapter three. I was trying to get it all out. <laughs> no, you're fine. Be, you got a pen up here, you probably don't have any. There might be one word left. Oh. That word. Yeah, the yeah, the scent to me. I can't I never can say that word right. I mean, yes, the scent to me. I even wrote it out like that. Yeah, that's that's yeah. You know, I think about it. Get or gets get get cinnamon? Get cinnamon? Like with an yeah. S on it? Yeah. Sim. Sim. Uh, Get simony. Yeah. Get cinnamon. Like that. Sim. I said get simony. Did I do it? Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Get okay, that, I want to make. Get cinnamon. Get cinnamon. Wait, do I still not? Get simony? Yeah. Get simony? Sorry, not get simony. Confidant. Confidant. I know that one. Even. I think that's all. I don't know why. Ecclesiastes. I don't know why I underlined that. I never read that anyway, so that's fine. Uh, promontory, is that right? Promontory. promontory. I want to make sure that's right. Okay, his name, John Don. Oh, Don. okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure that was right. I don't want to be saying nobody with paradox, so we'll all know that. Thorpe, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Kairos. Uh, reciprocate. <laughs> Sometimes I push my words together, uh -huh. and they'll sound very... Like that hillbilly slang mixed with the city, I guess. Reciprocate. Reciprocate. <laughs> Reciprocate. <laughs> Saying it fast. Let me see. Vindictate. Okay. That's not premise. That's premise, ain't it? Premise. Premise. That's why I wrote premise. Okay. Ooh. Vindictate? What is that? Vindictate. That's not what that thing says. Let me see. I better read it. No, vindicate. That's right. Yeah. No, wait. I didn't say it like you did. Vindicate. Vindicate? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm going to write I, it. I remember hearing you say it once. Before, but well, yeah. I never spell them right, but I spell them out to where I can. Okay. Vindicate? Yeah. Vindicate. Yeah. I'll have it. Vindicate. Okay. Yeah. Ain't spelled right, but it's where I can read it. Close enough. Validity. Synopsis. Okay. Circumvent. Okay, that's good. You're too smart for your own good. No, that's <laughs> no just kidding. Work, you know, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your help. Years ago, uh, You're smart anyway. <laughs> I know, I'm smart. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me see. Okay. Okay, let's go. <coughs> Chapter 3, The Golden Ladder. Now that we are prepared to act, we are ready to go to the Golden Ladder of Recovery. This program will focus on the eight steps of the ladder to help us reach the top. It is very important we do not take this lightly. We must be ready to climb to the top or else not begin to the ascent of the ladder at all. Each step is contingent upon the step below it. Steps cannot be bypassed or neglected. Each one is important for the recovery to be complete. If we are now ready to arise, both of our inactivity and out of the pit, let us approach the ladder. The basis of the golden ladder is found in Matthew 5, 3 through 12. In it, the Lord tells us exactly how we can get out of the pit. And let's be clear here, this teaching is not merely for the addict, it is for all of us. 
It is impossible for any of us to get to heaven by our good works or efforts. We all need God. Therefore, no one should look down upon another, nor should one feel inferior to one another. We are all in need of mercy, and this latter represents the grace that God has given to deliver us. We know the validity of this program because it comes from Christ himself, as he lays each sentence out for us as a road map to live by. Briefly, we will go over the order of the latter. Then we will elaborate each step in its importance. Read through each of the steps and look at their application. At Arise, we encourage action. Each step will have work that we must do as well as a spiritual basis for our program. Examine every step carefully and keep in mind the steps of the program as you ascend up the ladder. For instance, step 7 calls for us to make peace with others. Keep this in mind as early as step 1. You can be preparing for those whom you need to make peace with later. A quick synopsis of the Golden Ladder. Step 1. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We understand we are unable to help ourselves, so pride and self-esteem are put away. As a result, we stop trying to figure out how to fix our problem in ourselves, but we must be willing to admit our inability to facilitate our recovery. Once we do, we begin the ascent up the golden ladder with humility. We express this fact in three ways. First, we acknowledge it to ourselves. We objectively face our own helplessness by writing down our previous failures. This is done only for our own selves and can be destroyed immediately afterwards. The reason for writing them down is that we need to formulate our dilemma in our own mind and writing it out helps. Don't hold back. We must be completely honest with ourselves. We do not justify ourselves or make any excuses. To do so will only aid in our addiction. Next, we confess this fact to God. He alone can bring us up out of this horrible pit. We are relinquishing our lordship over our own lives to him. Failure to do so is proof of pride and self-reliance. No help can be found without admitting our powerlessness over our situation. If we are admitting we have no power in ourselves to mend our situation, then we must believe that someone can, or else we stay in the bottom of the pit. You may not know everything about religion or even how to pray, but you are a person made in the image of the Almighty God with a soul that searches for meaning. Tell him that you need his help. Third, we are willing to tell others that we are unable to help ourselves. This public confession of weakness is crucial to the program. We can admit failure to ourselves and to God easier than we can to other people. It makes us feel vulnerable, but that is the point. We are. Confess it openly and a burden will be lifted. Step 2. Blessed are they that mourn. We now acknowledge our failures. To mourn means to grieve or hurt over failures or sins. To do so, we have to first understand what we are mourning over. This will take some deep soul searching. We have turned to God in step one, and now we are being specific in what we need help with. We are not being vague at this point. Whatever the addiction is, we address it properly. We do not circumvent the issue. Think of it as going to the doctor. You may have ignored the symptoms for a long time, or perhaps you have self-diagnosed and it has not worked. You then admit your own inadequacies and trust someone greater than yourself. That is step one. Now that you are on step two, you realize that going to the doctor will do you no good if you do not let him get to the heart of the problem. When they ask what you came to see them for, you must be honest with them. To evade their questions is detrimental to your recovery. You help yourself immensely by being honest. In the second step, you are being honest about the problem. But once again, we address this issue in the same three ways we did in step one. We take responsibility for our failures and bring them out in the open. Confession of failure is recognized in ourselves first. No excuses, no sugarcoating it, be blunt with yourself. Then you need to confess your sins to God. We must be looking up towards God for our healing. Do not just randomly pick an object or a person to confess to, for it takes God to heal us. Remember the ladder goes up, not down. We are not trying to dig out of the pit, we are ascending. Keep this in mind throughout the whole process and reach up to God for help. Confess your faults to him as we only confess your faults to him as one who really mourns over their failures. Finally, we confess our failures to another person. Use discretion here. We can make vague confessions of failures publicly but save the more personal, deeper issues for someone you trust. This is crucial for spiritual healing, for addiction is a spiritual disease. The Bible tells us to confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Choose someone who will pray for you and support you, whether it be a minister, a lay person, or a friend. 
Make sure they are there for you and will understand their role in your healing. If they care neither what if they care not whether you find help, then they should not be entrusted with your burdens. Step 3, blessed are the meek. The definition of meek is important for this step. To be meeked was a term used when a wild horse was broken to ride. The wildness had to be trained out of the horse. That did not diminish its strength. It merely relocated it. In this third step, we are now being trained to respond to the temptation of addiction. Having focused on our weaknesses in the previous steps, we now begin to take the position of strength. This step forces us to face our addictions and see where our weak points are located. Having only recently been in the pit, we cannot expect to be perfect. This gives us the opportunity to allow God to work with us on our shortcomings. Once again, we do not speak in abstract terms here. We want to stay serious in our recovery. What is causing the craving or temptation? Make note of it. Confess it to your close confidant. Work on a plan that will ensure a better success. If there are certain people or places that seem to trigger the wrong impulses within you, then make note of that. The key here is as in the... The key here, as in the past, is to be honest with yourself. Work on the parts that are lacking and solidify the parts that are working. Attendance and interactions with the recovery group are paramount. You're training away your bad behavior. Most importantly, your training will need to focus on the spiritual. Prayer cannot be overstated here. You are being trained by one who is higher than us. Let him work with you and allow the Holy Spirit to expose your weaknesses so they can be fixed now. Not allowing this will lead to certain failure later. Step 4. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Working on getting established in the faith. Work on getting established in the faith. Having begun to pray and look to God, we cultivate that here the hunger we once had for the addiction needs to be replaced with the hunger for righteousness. Righteousness simply means a right standing with God. You may be very new to this, but remember this is your training. Many people fall by the wayside because they have not been properly prepared. At this step, we want you to work towards educating yourself in God's word and becoming more and more dependent on him. This step involves homework that should carry you through the rest of your life. That is, you need to discipline your habits so you are putting yourself in a position to succeed. It may seem hard at first, but taking baby steps will lead to running after a while. Three things are important. Number one, develop your prayer life. This cannot be overstated. At first, work towards spending time in prayer. You may find that five minutes starting out is sufficient. Strive towards that time you have set for yourself and do not deviate from it. Number two, read your Bible. Described as the word, described as the sword of the spirit, it can combat every attack from Satan. Addiction is a spiritual attack and you have been equipped with a sword to defend yourself. Use it. Become skillful with the Bible, and you will find it unbelievably useful. You may only be focused enough to read one chapter a day. That's okay. Just make sure you read it. We're not trying to impress anyone. We want to understand what we read. If you struggle, don't give up. We all struggle with certain scriptures, but we must learn to trust God to give us the meaning of the scriptures we need as we come to them. Start in the New Testament at Matthew and work your way through Revelation to begin with. The third thing... The third thing in your training is to go to church. Attend a church that preaches the truth and has people who care for your soul. The addiction group is great and should be providing you with spiritual insight, but it can only go so far. The preaching in the church under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost is unparalleled in its usefulness to your recovery in Christian life. One word of warning, be realistic. Do not set unattainable goals, for they will not work. You can promise to spend an hour in prayer, read 10 chapters a day, and attend church five times a week, but that is not practical. Give a few minutes to prayer a couple times a day and read a chapter or two every day. Attend church regularly, and you will be giving yourself the best training you can have. Step 5, blessed are the merciful. This step gives us the opportunity to reciprocate the... This step gives us the opportunity to reciprocate the mercy that has been shown to us. The term merciful means to have compassion for someone. They are in a position to be punished. In this step, we focus on forgiving those who have wronged us. There is no growth to be found we will not, when we will not let go of the past. As we ascend the golden ladder, we are striving to get out as we ascend the golden ladder, we are striving to get as far out of the pit with God's help as possible. Unforgiveness is a weight that will hold us down. We have recognized our shortcomings and failures in the past and have confronted them in steps one and two. 
Now we turn that understanding towards others. We are not condoning bad behavior and actions of others in the past, but we are willing to forgive them at this point. Make a list of people and circumstances that have hurt you in the past. This list is not for minor infractions, but is reserved for those who have blamed in the past to justify our condition. For instance, perhaps a bad home life has been the scapegoat to vindictate. Perhaps a bad home life has been the scapegoat to vindictate. Mm, vindictate. For instance, perhaps a bad home life has been the scapegoat to vindictate addiction. Let go of it. Forgive whomever you feel let you down or caused you to stumble. Your past does not have to determine your future. You can choose to defend yourself by blaming others, or you can take action now. Once again, we face this head on. We are honest in our evaluations. Perhaps some who have blamed in the past were not really to blame at all. Instead, we may have wanted to act like victims and seized an opportunity to do so. On the other hand, there may have been others who have been defended or may have been injurious to us, but we're not willing to admit it. Take time to reflect on each situation and be willing to forgive each one. If you feel the need to go and talk to certain people, by all means do so. But regardless of their attitude or defense of themselves, do not harbor ill feelings towards them. Honestly, try to forgive each one so you feel as though they are not your enemy. This will take God to help you, so call out upon him. Name the people and situations to him. As 1 Peter 5 and 7 tells us, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. He can help you show mercy even to those who do not deserve it. He can help you show mercy even to those who do not deserve it. Step 6. Blessed are the pure in heart. Pure in heart means that our motives are pure, so we can stand in the presence of God. The application for us on this sixth step is that we examine these motives. Knowing our need to get out of the pit, we should contemplate our reasons for doing so. The entire golden ladder is based on the premise that we are honest with ourselves and God. So in analyzing our motives, we must be honest. As we progress up the ladder, our motives may change. That would be good. For instance, perhaps the reason for attending the Arise program was because it was necessary for legal purposes. That may have been a good motive to begin with, but that purpose should change as you are getting closer to the top of the ladder. Or maybe you came because you felt like your addiction was ruining your future, or you were looking for someone who could offer help. We can certainly relate. That is a good motive. Because of that good motive, you work your way through the program. When you get to the sixth step, you will likely to be closer to God because you're doing your best to draw near to him. Because of your pure heart or pure motives, he's helping you in ways you may not even comprehend at this point. Whenever you are on the ladder, you need to always evaluate your motives and perhaps adjust your focus. You started towards a better life simply by arising and doing something about your situation. As you progress, keep a journal of where you want to be and work towards that. Maybe what you first envisioned when you came to this program should now be recalibrated. Your progress has opened your eyes to more possibilities and a future that you never dreamed possible. Now write down where you want to be. Question your heart. Make sure that it is a pure motive. That is, make sure it lines up with God's plan for you. Does it hint at any selfishness that could exclude those to whom you are entrusted to protect? That is, make sure it lines up with God's plan for you and see if it hints any selfishness that would exclude those to whom you are entrusted to protect. If your motives are pure, then you need to set up a course of action to achieve those goals. We encourage action at Arise. Figure out what you want out of life and then be serious about achieving them. With God's help, anything is possible for you. Step 7. Blessed are the peacemakers. In this seventh step, we work towards righting the wrongs we have caused. We are now peacemakers, not the peacetakers we once were. Our actions in the past must now be confronted. While other programs may encourage this step earlier, Jesus held this one back until later. Now that we have examined our motives and are allowed access into the presence of God, we need to work towards righting our wrongs. Jesus said that we must go and make things right with a brother who has something against us. Seeing how we have forgiven others of the wrongs they committed against us, we must now work towards reconciliating with those we have wronged. This must be done through careful examination. Make another list. This list will most likely include friends, family, those who have done business with. It should include the people who have harmed and how our actions have affected them. Next, we examine the situations and diagnose each one honestly. Now comes the hard part. 
going to these people and asking for forgiveness or what we can do to help them heal. There is no insignificant gesture we are making because it will include swallowing our pride as we confess our faults and admit our failures. As we show later, this may include giving ourselves to fix the problem. And even then, there will be some who will never forgive or forget the hurt you caused. But you must be willing to do whatever is reasonable to repair the damage that is done. This is a hard step, but if we are willing to address these issues, both now and throughout our lives, we can have complete victory from the pit of addiction. Step 8. Blessed are they that are persecuted. Be on guard. Having ascended on the top of the ladder, we now stand watchful over the enemies that will attempt to destroy us. We are blessed with persecution now. That seems like a paradoxical statement, but it's true. The reason we are being attacked is because we have been successful on the ladder. We can enjoy happiness now like never before, but that doesn't mean we are naive. We stand watchful, knowing there will be attacks from our adversary that will try to thwart our progress and drag us back into the pit. This may come from people, places, or situations that may seem innocent enough, but they could be deadly to our recovery. As in previous steps, we look at this objectively. Make note of threats and address them properly. Make note of threats and address them properly. The former addict will be persecuted by others who are not happy themselves. While some will use your recovery as inspiration, others would rather pull you down and attempt to climb up themselves. These friends may endeavor to put you in compromising situations that will threaten your recovery. Evaluate everything. For instance, if an invitation is presented for you to attend something, ask yourself if it will be detrimental to your recovery. What will the environment be like? Who's going to be there? Will it be beneficial or harmful to my recovery? Questions like these will reveal pitfalls along the way. Just be completely honest with yourself and you will be able to differentiate you will be able to defend you, defend you. Just be completely honest with yourself and you will be able to differentiate. Just be completely honest with yourself and you will be able to differentiate between what is innocent and what is dangerous. Jesus says you are blessed when others insult you and lie on you and accuse you falsely. Do not get discouraged because of the talk of others. This is simply persecution by Satan using them. Someone will always stereotype you or label you to justify their actions against you. You know where you've been brought up from. Your motives are pure, therefore you are in good standing with God. When others speak evil of you, remember that is either their ignorance of your recovery or just malicious attacks driven by Satan to cause you to stumble. Be watchful and make note of everything and you can stand victorious atop the golden ladder. Here you will draw the admiration of those who love and respect you, as well as the ear of those who are jealous of you and wish to see you fall. While step eight is the apex of the ladder, it does not mean we can step off the ladder into some sense of nirvana on this earth. We are happy because we are looking towards Jesus. The guilt and shame have been taken from us, and we are no longer grovel in the muck and filth of addiction. However, we remain on the ladder, happy though we are, until the time comes to pass from this world to the kingdom of heaven. At times, our pride and self-confidence may knock us back to the first step, but we can be assured that we are not going to draw back into the previous state we have been brought out of. Churches throughout the world can attest to the fact that the addict can be set free in a moment's time. That freedom begins once we take the first step out of the bottom of the pit because, by faith, we are climbing towards Jesus. As we begin the ascent up the golden ladder, we want to look at different facets of this program. First of all, we look at the spiritual nature of addiction. As we realize the spiritual aspect of our condition, it forces us to look to Jesus to heal us spiritually. In each step, we examine their spiritual basis. This is not merely a program to motivate someone to get better. It is designed to get the heart of our addictions. We should take comfort in knowing our addictions and failures are not new problems, for they are as old as man has walked on earth. Jesus preached this ladder 2,000 years ago as a solution to every problem we face in life. I care not whether a person has ever darkened a church door before or if they grew up in the church pew. Each step deals with issues we all face, sinner and saint alike. Addict or not, we all come the same way. Our visualization of the ladder helps us understand the progress we are making as we follow Christ out of the pit. Each step uses the scriptures to help us understand the nature of addiction and the cure. But also, we want each step to be viewed objectively. We are not just spouting theological arguments and theories. We do not want to get wrapped up in subjective reasoning. We want to deal with our addictions in reality. 
Each step will force us to be sincere in our recovery and will involve us doing something to move forward. In the Bible, we are warned that faith without works is useless. Believing something without doing anything about it is called being dead in Scripture. Just knowing something is not right but not working on fixing it is completely useless. We are not here to simply educate you on the spiritual nature of addiction. We are insisting that you arise and take action. As we move up the ladder, let's keep two things in mind. We are a combination of body and spirit, and each one has its own desires. The Bible tells us that these two natures are constantly fighting against each other. The body wants to indulge in things that could be harmful, while the spiritual nature draws us towards God. The key to moving in the right direction is to get our two natures working in unity. When we can understand the spiritual aspect of addiction and the effect it has on us physically, then we can formulate a plan to counter it effectively. This will make the ladder traversable. In our program, we emphasize the importance of having others around us who support our efforts. We all need one another. We should celebrate each other's successes and weep over one another's failures. As the 17th century English poet John Donne once wrote, No man is an island. We recognize this need both physically and spiritually. Don's famous quote says, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less as well as if a promontory. Europe is the less as well as if a promontory. Europe is the less as well as if a promontory as well as if a manner of thy friends or thy own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. We realize that while climbing the golden ladder, we will suffer persecution from others. This is why Romans 12, 14 through 18 is so applicable for us as it states, Ask God to bless everyone who mistreats you. Ask him to bless them and not to curse them. When others are happy, be happy with them. And when they are sad, be sad. Be friendly with everyone. Don't be proud and feel that you know more than others. Make friends with ordinary people. Don't mistreat someone who has mistreated you. But try to earn the respect of others and do your best to live at peace with everyone. The teaching of surrounding ourselves with others is taught in nearly every recovery group and is evidenced throughout the Bible. Do not underestimate the power of a good support system. In the Bible, the church is referred to as the body. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says God has placed us in that body as he saw fit. It goes on to say that one member of the body could never say to another that they do not need each other. Now you may feel as though you are not contributing much to the group, but we must trust that God has placed you where you are for a reason, and he will use you as he sees fit. We need each other. Trust the process and the Lord, trust the process and the Lord and you will come to realize how valuable you are to everyone around you and to the kingdom of God. May everyone who comes through this program find support and understanding from others, then reciprocate that support and understanding to others. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 26 by saying, God put our bodies together in such a way that even the parts that seem the least important are valuable. He did this to make all parts of the body work together smoothly, with each part caring about the others. If one part of our body hurts, we hurt all over. If one part of our body is honored, the whole body will be happy. So yes, you are very valuable. If we understand this, both for ourselves and towards others, this program will be successful. Therefore, we will celebrate the successes of others. When a person has gotten even the smallest victory in their recovery, when we want to re- when a person has gotten even the smallest victory in their recovery, we want to rejoice with them. What seem what may seem minute or insignificant to the onlooker will not seem small to those of us who have been where they are. A person who has been delivered from addiction for years was at one point celebrating a week of freedom themselves. These victories are calls for celebration because we are proud of all who progress up the ladder. Likewise, we encourage others who are struggling. We are not trying to outdo someone else. We vow to lift up the hands that hang low and strengthen the feeble knees. We show compassion and support to everyone. After all, we have all failed and come short of the glory of God. Just like the woman in the Bible who was brought to Jesus and legally could have been stoned to death for adultery, we have all failed. 
But Jesus warned those with rocks in their hands that only those without sin could throw those stones. We have all slipped and fell along this way. Any of us who have ascended the golden ladder could testify to slipping down a couple steps. If a person has broken... uh, If a person has broken over their addiction, we do not throw stones. Instead, we offer a hand of support as we encourage them to get up and move forward once again. Another important aspect of this program is the one-on-one relationships we develop with others. Having realized we are not an island, we seek out someone with whom we seek out someone with whom we have confidence to help us get along. This is our confidant, the person who will help us get along the ways we make confessions of our weaknesses and failures to somebody. They must be someone with whom you can share personal issues with and confidentiality. While our program involves personal soul searching and petitions made to God for recovery, we recognize the importance of formulating our plans and petitions out loud to another person. They are not simply people with whom we can bounce ideas off of. They are friends and mentors who can relate to your situation and give you feedback when necessary. They are strong, spiritually-minded people who have your best interests in mind and can be good listeners at times, all while also giving you a reality check when needed. Choose this person wisely. Perhaps they're ministers who you have confidence in, or maybe they are lay members, friends, or family. The point is, choose them based on their character. We should realize that we are all recovering addicts from the pit of addiction. Seeing how we were all sinners at one time, therefore your confidant does not necessarily have to be someone who has suffered from the same addiction you have. It would be great if they had, but the character of the confidant is more important at this point. They need to be someone with whom you can speak candidly. They need to be available day or night. You may be calling them at 3 in the morning, needing a listening ear. They may be called upon to come to you in the midnight hours. Ask them for help, and if you have chosen the right person based on their qualifications of character, they will be more than happy to see you make it through. The power of a proper network of people working towards the same goals cannot be overstated. Even Jesus surrounded himself with men and women who were encouraging to him in his ministry. In some of his most intense moments, Jesus called for his close group of friends to be there. For instance, just before his crucifixion, he called for Peter, James, and John to go with him and pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. He called for Peter, James, and John to go with him and pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. He called for Peter, James, and John to go with him and pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. If Jesus surrounded himself with people he had confidence in, how much more should we do the same? After all, the Bible speaks of the power of banding together, claiming in Ecclesiastes 4 and 12. And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. There is power in numbers if they work towards a common goal and fight a There is power in numbers if they work towards a common goal and fight a common enemy, in this case addiction. This power is also seen in the Bible, which is filled with groups of two who work together and encourage one another. Time would fail to list them all, but a few come to mind. Moses and Aaron, Ruth and Naomi, David and Jonathan, Paul and Silas. When Jesus sent his disciples out, he sent them out by twos. Solomon even warns us in Ecclesiastes 4 and 10 that if two are walking together and one of them falls, his companion can help him get up, but the pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. As you work your way along the golden ladder, know that you're not alone. The importance of the group and your close contacts will be imperative to your recovery. Likewise, your availability for others will be vital to their recovery. Hebrews 12 warns us not to forsake assembling together. The writer tells us to exhort one another. If we can meet together and work on this ladder collectively, we can find help in others when we need it, and we can help others when they need it. So as we move along the ladder, let us keep this in mind. From day one until we leave this world for heaven, we all need one another. Embrace that, and your recovery will move along rapidly. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doeth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
The great cloud of witnesses spoken of here are those who endured hardships before them. All addicts should take heart to the testimonies of others who have been brought up out of the bottom of the pit. This should encourage us all, seeing how the same God who will set one free will set whoever looks to him free as well. I have seen men and women bound by drugs, sex, alcohol, and countless other addictions set free in a single church service. The weights and sins could be applied as the bondages of addiction and sins. The writer said that they sit so easily. The writer said that they so easily make one to stumble. If we are going to run this race properly, we must be willing to let everything go that will cause us to stumble whether that be friends, family members, or circumstances that impede our spiritual recovery. This race is not a hundred-yard dash. It is a marathon, and the prize at the end is your very soul. You must be willing to recognize the things that are harmful to running this race and deal with them properly. If not, then recovery is improbable. The passage says that Jesus endured the cross and despised the shame, then took his place in heaven. Realize that the path to recovery is not going to be a bed of roses. There are going to be some hardships along this ladder. If you're looking for an easy way out without any bumps along the way, you're going to be terribly disappointed. There is no magic formula to recovery. There is a path you can get on that will take you out of the pit, but it's going to be tough at times. There is an illustration given about a man getting on a plane. If the man got on the plane and the stewardess told him to put a parachute on and that would make his flight more enjoyable, he would put it on. But after a while, the man would begin to get less comfortable with it, and upon seeing others take theirs off, would figure that the stewardess had lied to him. In disgust, he would rip it off and throw it down angrily. But suppose the presentation was offered differently. Suppose the same stewardess offered the same man that exact parachute, but instead, this time she told him that it might make him a little uncomfortable. But somehow, but somewhere in the next few hours, the back hatch would open and drop the man 30,000 feet. Without the parachute, the man would be nothing more than a greasy spot on the ground. Now the man would not let go of that parachute for anything in this world. This time he realizes the necessity of the parachute. Okay, so now a person wants out of the bondage of addiction and knows if he doesn't get out, he will be destroyed both physically and spiritually. Here is the ladder. It may, li it may be a little rough at times, but without it, there's no hope for you. What do you do? You hang on with everything you've got because there is no alternative. The parachute in the illustration is Christ, and Hebrews 12, 2 says we are to look unto Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, as the New Living Translation puts it, as the famous paraphrase of Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland goes, if you don't know where you are going, any road will do. We do not want to be that person. Once we arise, though, we are objectively moving towards a goal, the ladder of grace that is now being illuminated to show us the way out. This ladder is the only one worth ascending. The goal here is to get our eyes on the one who will lead us out of addiction. Looking to him will lead us to the proper ladder. The Holy Spirit will come and guide us into all truth. He will move us to the golden ladder. Our eternal soul cries out for help, and there we find the bottom step of the ladder of recovery. did not do very good on that.